2024 saw the number of Grand Prix increase to 24 with the return of China after a short absence that added to the debuts of Miami in 2022 and Vegas in 2023. They stayed at six sprint races, but the format did change. So what would 2025 bring for us? Well... 2022 saw 22 Grand Prix, there were 23 in 2023, there were 24 in 2024, so surely 2025 means 25 Grand Prix. Well, thankfully, no. Here's what the calendar looks like. Well, it all kicks off in Australia on the 14th to 16th of March before a short hop to Shanghai. Then there are Three, back-to-back Japan, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia before jumping across the pond. A lot of ponds, in fact, to Miami. Then it's Europe with Italy, Monaco and Spain. Another jump across the pond to Montreal and Canada before Austria, UK and Belgium, followed by Hungary, the Netherlands, Italy, Azerbaijan and Singapore. Then back to the USA, this time for Austin, before heading down to Mexico and Brazil. Then it's back up to Vegas before heading over to finish the season with Qatar and Abu Dhabi. So quite a lot to discuss from the announcement of the 2025 Grand Prix season, and I'm delighted to have with me Alex Kalinorkis. First of all, Alex, what are your initial thoughts of the 2025 calendar? Yeah, hi, Bryn. Hi, everybody. Um, my initial thoughts are a bit like you say, thankful that it's not 2025 races. It's more, you know, obviously it's a privilege to work in Formula One and to cover Formula One for a living, but it's more the concerns about burnout, whether that's team staff or if that's, you know, what anybody uh, anybody does of the, the drivers and everybody gets to fly around uh, first class and uh, stay in absolute luxury. But there we go. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, I think the debate that's been had for a number of years now about the expanding calendar under Liberty Media's ownership, uh, whether that devalues F1 races, I think there's there's a lot to that. Unless you're going to get a season where it's like 2021 and really it's just more, 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 more. Uh, it, it, it is hard to sort of uh, to justify sort of an ever expanding calendar. And I definitely think, yeah, that the, the devaluation argument has some merit. But uh, but yeah, no, other, other than that, there's not really a lot else uh, to say about the 2025 calendar. There's no real surprises. I think this is largely uh, what everybody expected. But there has been a bit of a change, hasn't there? And I announced at the beginning that Australia is the first Grand Prix of the season, which I have to say I love. And that's because of Ramadan falling between the 1st and the 30th of March next year and then deciding not to start the season over in the Middle East. I think that's a, that's a welcome change, isn't it? No Saturday Grand Prix. Yeah, I think um, for a lot of F1 fans, that'll be that'll be really welcome. Australia, obviously, uh, since the, the the Melbourne slot opened up in 1996, being, being the season opener, uh, a lot of fond memories of that. The city is one of the world's great cities. It embraces Formula One really nicely as well. And the teams do a lot of great promotional events around there. And yeah, it just, um, it, it also, I think it will break the season up nicely. Like there isn't any confirmation from F1 uh, yet about when testing will be. But uh, you suspect it will, well, I suspect it will remain uh, in Bahrain because that's, you know, it's, it works so well there. You've got um, Aramco but essentially paying for pre-season testing. That's what allows it to be televised and everything like that. What will change will it, will it with the Australia being uh, the season opener? No matter where they were to test, even if there were to be a big change, it wouldn't be the week before as we've had in uh, the last few years. Essentially, it just takes so long to get down to Australia, get everything set up, get people uh, not suffering the effects of jet lag as I am after returning home from Japan uh, just a couple of days ago. But yeah, so I think um, testing will be a little bit bit more of a gap. It won't be sort of you know week to week to week as it was uh, as it was the last few last few years but uh, but yeah i think the other the other interesting thing about moving bahrain and saudi arabia to april is obviously they're going to be a lot hotter simply just because of you know shifting forward a few months and, and, and getting closer to the to the summer in the northern hemisphere but the key thing there is that yes they are night races but you're looking more towards what happened in qatar last year where you've got still very high temperatures uh, allied to in the Jeddah tracks case uh, a very punishing circuit the drivers were already talking this year I remember being sat in the press conference Charles Leclerc Sergio Perez talking about it being one of the most punishing races because of the nature of that track the concentration levels they have to get to um, and obviously it's very very high speed now you're adding a serious heat element to it as well and that could potentially be a safety concern so yeah it's gonna it's gonna feel very different for the drivers um, but yeah that that sort of change I think is, is welcome just shuffling things around uh, around uh, a little bit and as I said, heading back to Australia for nostalgia reasons. It's also interesting to see Japan is staying where it, where it was, where it is. It's moved to this earlier date too, which I think was a was a deemed a fairly big success recently. Um, so that's good to see as well. But I know you're a fan of triple headers, and 2025 is going to feature 
three of these triple headers. Yeah, definitely not a fan of that, Bryn. Um, no, uh, just just on the Japan, Japan thing quickly. Obviously, I, I was out there and and, and chatting to some people um, from Formula One, and and basically, it seems to have been everybody's satisfied with the change. I think um, the reason uh, one of the one of the key elements of that race being now at the start of the season is it coincides with what is naturally like the peak of Japan's tourism season. So that sort of works nicely for the race promoters. You've potentially got people uh, going there who might not have, say, come in October time because obviously the uh, the cherry blossom is out and uh, Japan looking extremely pretty. So it, it, it works nicely with what's going on in Japan at the time. I mean, there was a slight, maybe slight dip in ticket sales, but from F1, the promoter's point of view, that's purely because the previous race was only uh, basically only six months uh, previously. They haven't had as long a time uh, to sell tickets for this year. So they've got a nice year's run up uh, again for 2025 so yeah that'll be uh, that'll be good uh, uh, good to see again i am also under the impression that the china back to back of australia might not necessarily be as nailed on as it's made to look in this calendar release because as ever with china there's a lot of concerns about like customs and getting things in in time is there enough time from a back to back with australia as it is uh, at the moment to get that all done so there is the there is a faint possibility or at least backup discussions that maybe it might end up being Japan as the second race. I'm, I'm not saying that is going to happen, but I know that that is the sort of uh, a fullback uh, plan or fullback option or discussions at least being had with that. But yeah, back to triple headers. I mean, yeah, well, what was the year 2018, 2019 when the first triple header came in and F1 said, well, that will never happen again. Then the pandemic happened and obviously there was a lot of money to be made by packing the calendar out. And yeah, triple headers are, are just, uh, just a thing to happen. I mean, we're obviously, my role in writing for Autosport, we're, we're very lucky. We, we're able to sort of split jobs. So to avoid that burnout, so people aren't going to race after race after race after race, including in a triple header. But, you know, for other elements of the championship, it's just very, very punishing. Now, of course, these are these are choices people make. It's, it's a great privilege, as I, as I said earlier on in the video, to work in Formula One, but it doesn't stop it, A, being a job and also being very, very demanding. So it is always just going to be, just going to be uh, very tricky. That said, there are some odd gaps the, there's only basically uh, there are two grand prix in july but there's a there's a big old three week gap between the british grand prix at uh, the start of july and the belgian grand prix at the end of july so effectively there's like a double summer break so that certainly shakes things up differently uh they have closed another gap in the calendar um, by moving singapore back a little bit compared to to what it what, what will be the case this year and and last year as well but yeah just ending the season again with the las vegas um um qatar Abu Dhabi triple header. I mean, yeah, getting from getting from Vegas to Abu Dhabi at the end of 2023 was hard enough. So I don't envy anybody uh, having to do that at all. But um, but yeah, they do appear to be to be here to stay. And uh, and 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 yeah, we just have to everyone involved. We just have to get on with it, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, let's just run through the triple headers. Suzuka, if it happens in this order, as you say, Japan, Bahrain, Saudi. You can kind of understand Bahrain, Saudi. That works, doesn't it? As a back to back, that works. So you've also got. Italy, Monaco, Spain, that sort of kind of also works as well. They're not huge travel distances. They are distances, but not huge. But Vegas, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, it doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Well, I think, first of all, with the first one with, you know, Japan being a triple header with Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, I think that via Abu Dhabi. So it is a natural stopping point in terms of you can get from one race in the Far East to stopping in the Middle East and then the F1 teams and, and, and lots of other people heading back to Europe. But um, but yeah, I mean, just the one at the end is just, it's just a factor of setting that Vegas race uh, when they do. You know, it's it, it, it's F1's sort of jewel in the crown. I know that obviously very much famously used to be Monaco, but for, for Liberty Media, it's all about this Las Vegas race. I've made the argument that it should be the season finale. Now, that would have a financial implication because we know what Abu Dhabi uh, pays to have that privilege. Uh, but I think just from a spectacle point of view and, and, and interest levels, uh, potentially, it might make a nice nice change to, to, to do that for Las Vegas. But they are basically shutting down the city centre. You know, there's lots of objection to that. So I don't think they want to be moving it around uh, too much and just, you know, just they want to make this sort of proof of concept by this stage. They want to make sure it works and it gets a regular feature and, and things like that in terms of the schedule of Las Vegas, the city. So that's why that's sort of uh, there. Uh, and then we're going to come on to talk about uh, Miami and, and Montreal and things like that. When you've got so many races in one country, you have to space them out naturally. And fortunately, well, f from F1's position, fortunately, it offers very, very different things. So Miami and Vegas are essentially the corporate races. The ticket prices are ludicrous. They're there for people who, you know, can afford to pay to go and also for sponsors and businesses and make almost like a B2B sort of element to it. The Austin race is for the people we love the real race fans that's it's a very very different event it's a wonderful event because of it so that can sort of 
float around where it likes really but there really has to be some distance between miami and vegas so that's another element as to why it ends up at the end of the year all that being said there needs to be more gap between you know the vegas race and the next one because it's just a it's just a brutal brutal uh thing to have to go uh in terms of just just the just the exhaustion factor for the people involved going from Las Vegas to the Middle East. Yeah, well, I guess that, you know, we're going to have to like it or lump it, aren't we? Because you know, they're not going to change the Vegas Grand Prix. But I was looking at the calendar, Alex, and I wrote in big capital letters, so I knew that it was important, Canada, question mark. Not because, oh, I didn't think Canada should be in the in the calendar. I think it's a fantastic place. But the position of it in the calendar, and there's a statement here by Mohammed Ben Salem, the president of the FIA, which I want to read. I want to get it exactly right. So he says... The 2025 FIA Formula One World Championship calendar approved by the World Motorsport Council is a further illustration of our collective mission of meeting sustainability objectives through the regionalization of events. And I look at the calendar, Alex, and I just don't see a correlation because what are you? You're in Japan and Bahrain and Saudi. Then you go to Miami. Then you come back to Europe. Then you're in Europe and you go to Canada, come back to Europe again. It doesn't seem to marry up with these statements. Yeah, I mean... It, it definitely it sticks out like a sore thumb let's, let's let's put it that way because i have less of a problem with miami following on from the middle east rather than immediately starting in europe because when we talk about sustainability and formula one we are talking about motorsport to a certain extent you just get to the argument of what's the point of doing any of it if it's all just about you know if, if, if you see my point i'm not trying to minimize the impact of sustainability but this is a championship that flies all around the world there is going to be an impact um no matter what you do but definitely the canada race when you're reading through the calendar you're like right right it to everything totally flows and that one jumps out rather wildly um now with that the, the 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 race's position the promoter's position is we can't go earlier in the year because a twinning with miami would make a lot of sense if you're grouping races together their position is we can't do that because potentially the weather might have a big impact how many races already have we seen in the canadian grand prix that have been impacted by severe weather you know i, I was there in 2022 that was impacted by uh by a pretty severe or uh, uh, not the word typhoon hurricane sort of element it wasn't very dramatic but uh, i can't remember all the phones in the media center pinging off with the alerts of severe weather coming in rolling in over the st lawrence seaway and you know it, it does happen and also that race is aging it is the, the paddock facilities are, are fine but it's more the access roads and things getting in and out you know the the car parks a tiny strip along you know the the, the famous uh, uh rowing lake at the back of the paddock and things like that it's it's a it's it's an event that was that 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 could survive f1 and the size f1 was in the 70s and the 80s and moving forward but it's you see it appears to be on the limit if that makes sense so you add in severe weather and it can become a really severe issue so totally see the position there that's that's why they don't want to go any earlier so they say right well why couldn't they go any later in the year is there going to be that much crossover between fans coming from montreal and around canada and wanting to go to the austin race maybe but potentially not now the reason why the canadian race doesn't want that to happen is because you know that 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 those facilities get used for other things throughout the year and also you know they've got other things going on particularly lots of political elements to it at the same time so it is a tricky one it's you know whether f1 to make that sustainability point they might want to think about forcing Montreal to move, making, you know, financial concessions or whatever to make it happen. I don't know. But yeah, at the moment, it just sticks out. It it really undermines the sustainability point. As I said, you know, this is motor racing. This is a nomadic championship that flies around the world. So you're always going to have an impact. And that's a very worthy and very important moral debate to be having. Um, you know, again, the same as in like, should is, is, it, is it ethical for what is an existing event to to you know spend resources expanding just because it's you know that much bigger these days There's, that's a very worthy debate to be having but and this one in particular with sustainability in the terms of how the calendar is laid out yeah it just it really really sticks out badly it does and i i guess it's it's what like you say it is it's a it's one in a, in a in a whole host of races and so maybe we need to kind of overlook it and say well they've got to deal with 24 grand prix they've got to fit them in somehow and that's the way they've done it and let's just kind of move on from it but and it's not a bad calendar i, I said at the top i'm really excited to see it starting back in australia again and that's because we say ramadan falling between the 1st and 30th of march so it seems that they've also listened that fans weren't hugely uh, happy maybe with there being Grand Prix on Saturday and not on the Sundays. Yeah, I'll be honest, that's uh, that's news to me in terms of um, that reaction being the case, Bryn. But I think uh, in coming years, it will go back to the way it was previously, having Bahrain 
and Saudi as a season opener simply because they'll they'll pay for the privilege of, of that happening. I mean, I do think Australia is far superior as a season opener, but I think that's just the the reality of what happens in Formula One. What was it Lewis Hamilton quipped in Melbourne in 2020? Cash is king. And he certainly knows, doesn't he, when it comes down to this sort of thing. Are there any... Uh combinations of back-to-back circuits or layouts that you think will have a big knock-on effect you know where one track presents certain challenges and another the polar opposite or have they got a flow there as well i mean again it's sticking with the the start of the year it, australia and china if we were to be running that you know the the same cars the same scenario the same drivers in 2024 well that's a really strong start for ferrari even with what we know about the rb20 right ferrari potentially had the pace to win in Melbourne. We'll never quite know whether that really was the case because of what happened to Max Verstappen and the damage to Sergio Perez's car. But the expectation is the cooler temperatures in China, the track layout, the demands of the of the asphalt on, on the rubber, front graining, things like that. People are really talking up Ferrari for the coming race this year. So those being grouped together, let's also uh, take a minute here to think about what Carlos Sainz was saying in Japan. Ferrari thinks only a few upgrades. We might, we might really able to be able to fight Red Bull like, like on merit. I'm somewhat skeptical of that. Having 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 made that uh, that jokey point there, I was also very skeptical that Ferrari could do anything this year, and it would be Mercedes pushing Red Bull as the closest challenger. How wrong that was! So you know, let's take let, let's take them as their word. Fair enough. Let's say they do close things up, and there is a legitimate, real close title fight next year. What a, what a great uh, grouping that ends up looking like for Ferrari, going to two spaces where historically they're very strong in Melbourne and China, where they're predicted this weekend. That may well be blow out, blown out of the water and, and uh, sorry, next weekend in China. But that as a grouping does seem to, to, seem to start Ferrari off very strongly uh, next year. Yeah, and we haven't really looked at sprint races either. I mean, we've got six sprint races this season, same as last season, slightly different format, as I hinted to at the beginning with the qualifying and the way that's going to work. What's the story or what's the thinking or the talk about sprint races in 2025? Are they going to delay that decision or has that been announced as well? No, that's that's not come out yet. It's, it's the same as with testing. It just hasn't been agreed on yet. You know, there is, there's obviously a financial element to it. Having a sprint race does go into the negotiations uh, with, with every race promoter and and holding every uh, race um, throughout the year. And also they want to see how the concept works because they've tweaked it again, you know, yet another change to sprint, ra- uh, sprint race regulations. As I said, China coming next weekend is the first uh, first time we'll see the, the latest iteration of it. It's not too dramatic, but, you know, it does potentially, with the p- change to the Parc Ferme rules, mean that the, the, the this whole thing of like, we know exactly how the Grand Prix is going to play out in theory, that that is less than now. So yeah, if, 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 if sprint races finally are this amazing thing that every race wants one, potentially F1 then goes say, right, this is where we're going to have it. Do you want this? What's going on? They know certain track types work best. Spa, for example, that they really favor having sprint race there, into Lagos, things like that. Um, so yeah, we know sprint races are here to stay. F1 points to the fact that they just get more viewers for a sprint race rather than an extra practice session. So they are coming, but as of yet, no sort of confirmed details. But we'd expect that to sort of once now now the calendar's released, you'd expect that to, to start leaking out via the news, ideally in Autosport and, and Motorsport.com. Uh, but yeah, that will be coming, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it will. And of course, we'll bring all that news when it does come out. So final thoughts then on this 2025 calendar. 24 Grand Prix kicks off on the 14th of March, ends on the 7th of December. It's a long, long season, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's, it's very, very familiar on that front. Um, at the very least, it's not as finishing as late as in 2021, when obviously, of course, that was all very necessary because of the pandemic. But I do remember, yeah, yeah, the run up to Christmas and getting everything ready in terms of the season review content we do for Autosport was uh, was very busy, very challenging. I think our um, I think our Abu Dhabi uh, Grand Prix report ended up uh, buried in a in a magazine where we did the whole top fifty and the, the all the F one season review stuff. So uh, so yeah, glad glad to be avoiding that. And um, other than that, yeah, it's uh, it, it feels rather familiar the stretching from the March to December. Well, just think of those bargains you can get at the greatest gift shop in the world somewhere on the Las Vegas Strip that you can bring home ready for Christmas as well. So it is kind of lined up nicely. So at least you'll get some decent gifts for people for Christmas 2025. Well, Alex, thank you very much indeed. And thank you as well for watching. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell as well, and we'll bring you all the news of this season and next in Formula One and beyond. Thanks for watching. <laughs>